Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our session, The Price of Taking a Stance, with our special guest, Nushin Warren, Assistant Professor of Marketing at the University of Arizona's Eller College of Management. My name is Sanya. I'm a part of the higher education team here at Ivy Exec, and I will be helping to moderate today's session. Before we begin, I have a few brief housekeeping items for our audience. First, all attendees are in listen-only mode. However, we encourage you to engage in the session by asking questions, which you can do using the Q&A feature you can find in your controls at the bottom window. Please make sure to use this feature for all the questions you may have for the presenter, while we invite you to use the in-chat feature for sharing any thoughts you may have with the rest of the audience and the panelists. We will also be having a formal Q&A session during the last 20 minutes, but feel free to send in your questions throughout the session. And additionally, we are recording today's session, so you can look forward to receiving a copy of the recording via email in the coming days. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today. Nushin Warren joined the Eller College of Management in 2016 after earning her PhD in marketing from Texas A&M University. Before academia, Warren was a marketing manager at the sole representative of AstraZeneca in Tehran, Iran. Her areas of expertise include new product development and innovation, firm stock market communication strategies, the impact of top management on the effectiveness of marketing actions, and measuring the financial value of marketing actions and assets. Nushin is also a member of the Eller College Diversity and Inclusion Task Task Force. And with that, I would like to pass the floor to Nushin. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I would like to talk to you today about a, a phenomenon, a new action that is increasingly happening in the market, in the business world. And that is that firms increasingly have uh, started to take stands on socio-political issues that are polarizing and contentious. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of that. Nike, for example, used Colin Kaepernick as their endorser uh, for their ads. And uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, was a, the face of um, standing for racial inequality and police brutality. Um, Target has changed their bathroom policies to more inclusive to support transgender community. There are firms that change their packages or products like Doritos to um, rainbow colors for Pride Month in support of LGBT community. Um, Starbucks has had a lot of race campaigns to support racial equality. And um, Delta, for example, retracted their promotion offer for NRA members. They used to have a discount for NRA members, and they retracted it to support gun control and um, oppose the uh, increasing mass shootings. Um, so these examples um, are firms taking a stand for socio-political issues. And we think that this is because consumers have increasing demands now that firms get involved into these issues. 64% of global customers in 2018 was reported that they would buy or boycott a brand if um, they don't like their uh, stance for the societal issues or if they support it. And Edelman Group actually um, predicted that they, it will increase by 13% every year. Porter Novelli is another consulting company that in this year, in 2021, they reported that 76% of Americans now believe that firms do have greater responsibilities to get involved into social justice or injustice issues. Uh, so we decided to uh, define this phenomenon and then try to see the, its impact. Um, we define this as corporate socio-political activism, or CSA, for short. And what we define it as is public demonstration of support or opposition to one side of a partisan socio-political issues. So it needs to be a public demonstration. It needs to communicate firms' stance. Um, it can either be agreeing or disagreeing. And it should be for... Um, issues that are important for the uh, popular large group of community, but also 
triggers some emotion that can be um, conflicting and polarizing. If you look at all these issues that I've put here and I gave you examples of, these are issues that each one of us here in this webinar have some um, emotion or um, we have some ideas about it. However, my emotions and ideas might be completely different from someone else and it might be completely from um, different from some other person in this webinar. And that is the point of it. It makes a large group of people upset and a large group of people um, happy when firms take stands for such issues. And that is why managers are hesitant to do such activism. CMO survey um, had a survey on chief marketing officers recently that showed only 19% of CMOs feel that this is it's a safe or it's even a valid strategy for firms to take sides on this types of polarizing social issues. And we think that the reason for this uh, reluctancy of managers is that they perceive a conflict. They think that consumers might want us to do this. Consumers might feel that we should be value driven. But on the other hand, our shareholders, our investors, um, many other stakeholders might think that we should focus on our fiduciary duties. We should focus on business. Uh, we should focus on profit maximizing and do not divert the time and resource and money of the firm to a risky behavior that might alienate a large group of society. So managers um, do not know what can happen to the firm if they get involved to this risky behavior. And that is why we decided to uh, systematically investigate this. In 2016, my colleagues and I, we started collecting data on these types of issues. We collected 293 events um, from 2011 to 2016, and um, which was from a large group of publicly held firms. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples of this in our sample, we had Amazon when they removed Confederate flag merchandise from their website to support racial equality. We have Target uh, with their LGBT Pride Month, Chipotle, who prohibited guns from their stores. But it's not always liberal. We also have Kroger, who issued a statement in support of carrying gun in their stores at the time. Um, in our sample, what we what we observed was that um, most of the CSAs or activism have a liberal flavor. And the reason for that is that mainly conservative issues are issues that are a status quo. And a lot of times activism happens to change the status quo. So it will take a bit um, political affiliation of uh, liberals at, at the time in the society. So we collected these um, events and then we wanted to see how investors of the firm actually react to them. To do that, um, I'm just going to briefly tell you the procedure of the research, which is for each event, for example, for the Amazon's Confederate flag, we look at a window around this event two days before to two days after, and we observe the changes in the stock price of the firm. What, what, um, theory and finance literature suggests is that the collective wisdom of, wisdom of investors will push the stock price to um, show the predictive cash flow that is going to um, receive by the firm or get um, the firm loses it based on the action that is happening. So what we did is we looked at um, the stock price changes for all these events and we see that in fact, we see a decrease in a stock price when firms get involved in activism. Now, the reason for that, as we hypothesized, it might be that um, investors believe that you are spending time, resources, money, attention of the firm for a risky behavior. And this average um, stock uh, decrease that we see is 0.4%, um, which might seem trivial to you. But just to put it in perspective, if you look at General Electric that has $600 billion in assets, we are talking about $2 billion change in firm value after such activism. Even for firms with a medium asset, this is about $45 million. And for smaller firms like Nationwide, this translates to half a million dollars. So we are talking about a large and considerable amount of firm value and shareholders that is going to decrease on average when firms do activism. However, I do uh, emphasize on average because when we uh, get deeper into this, 
data set, we see that in fact, not always investors react negatively. We see firms like Amazon or Chipotle, when they did their activism, their stock price actually increased. But we also see times that firms' stock price get a large hit when they do activism. So why is that? Our question was, what does this variance come from? And um, can we manipulate it? Can we teach firms how to use this information to um, either decrease the negative effect or increase the positive effect of activism for their firms? Um, to answer that, we need to think why investors will react in one way or the other. Investors, when they, when they see activism, what they need to do is they need to predict what would be the outcome of such activism. So what they would think about or predict is how would your stakeholders react to this? If they believe that your stakeholders, your consumers, your employees, your government are going to be upset, then investors are much more pessimistic about this activism. We focus on these um, important stakeholders. Of course, firms have much, uh, many more stakeholders that we can later on look into, but first and foremost, consumers of the firm. If activism, is not something that resonates with consumers' values. They can be upset, they can stop buying, they can boycott the firm, which would be the example in uh, Target when they had the bathroom inclusive policy. They faced a large hashtag boycott Target. Uh, consumers got very upset about it. There was a lot of protest again against it. The same happened with employees as well. Employees of the firms are very important parts of firms. They can disrupt performance of the firm, sales of the firm. They can, um, we can lose them. They, they, the retention will get hurt, or we cannot be able to recruit um, talent that we want if employees are not on board with firms' value. And that will be an example that happened to Wafer. Wafer when a travel ban, a Muslim ban happened uh, during Trump's administration, Wafer suggested and offered furniture with discount to the government and their employees uh, were very upset about this. Uh, Wafer was uh, offering the furnitures for the immigration camps at the southern border of the country, but their employees walked out, they disrupted sale, then they uh, were very upset about Wafer getting involved to such um, issues. And finally, we focus on government. And the reason is that government has a large power, uh, especially where the firm is headquartered at. Government of a firm can have tax structures or subsidy benefits uh, structures for firms that if they retract them, it can hurt firms um, a lot. And that was what Delta faced. Um, when Delta had the retraction of their NRA um, promotion, because Delta is headquartered in Georgia, and Georgia is a very um, conservative government, they threatened Delta by taking a tax benefit from them that would cost Delta millions of dollars. So these are examples to just show that if stakeholders are not on board, investors can predict that this is going to hurt the firm a lot, and then they will decreased the um, stock price of the firm. And when I say they decreased, we basically mean that they start selling and dumping the stock, which will bring the uh, stock price down. But on the other hand, if they predict that this is going to be something that's aligned with customers, with um, firms, um, stakeholders, then they should reward the firm. And that is actually what we observed. What we did is that we um, collected the po political affiliations of each firm's st uh, stakeholders. So we collected the consumers' affiliations but by running very large surveys. We collected employees' affiliations by actually digging into Federal Commission election website and looking at each and every one of employees' political donations, whether to a liberal or a conservative campaign. And for the government, we looked at the government legislature of the headquarter to see whether they are conservative or liberal. And based on that, we could divide the um, activism and the uh, stakeholders, whether they're aligned to, with each other or not. For example, if a firm does a liberal activism and their consumers are liberal, we call that an aligned activism. But if they do a liberal activism and have very conservative consumers, then that's misaligned. When we did divide, we actually did observe that um, both uh, for 
consumers, uh, we saw that uh, when they're aligned uh, with the um, activism, we see a positive of 0.6% increase in the stock price. But interestingly, we see double that amount firms get hurt if consumers are misaligned with the firm. Uh, we see the same with the employees. Um, in, when employees are aligned, firms see a slight um, reward, but when they're not, firms see um, value destruction. And finally, with the government, we see the same, and we actually see the largest punishment from investors when they think that the government is not on your side with your activism, which makes sense because governments can immediately punish firms with tax uh, st structures and subsidy retractions. So this was what we observed in terms of investors, but we also wanted to look at their sales revenue of firms. And we see that the same happens with sales. In fact, when consumers are on board with activism, we see a large sales increase, both quarterly, which means that we look at quarter before to quarter after activism, but we also see that annually as well. And what is interesting in terms of sales is that, in fact, sales increases much more when consumers are happy, then it decreases when they're unhappy. And I think this is really an important point for firms because boycotts do die down quicker and firms get their sales back quicker if they can resonate with um, the group of consumers who reward them for this action. So this would give us some idea of, okay, if all our stakeholders are on board, great, we should go with activism. If they're not on board, maybe we should stop, think, and see if there's a better way to help societal change. But the problem is that it's not actually that as straightforward. If you look at these three stakeholders of the firm, there are very few firms that are lucky enough to have all their stakeholders on one page. For example, JCPenney, it was a more straightforward decision for them if they made it correctly because they have a government um, headquarters. Uh, they're headquartered in a place that the government is conservative, consumers were conservative, and employees were conservative at a time. But we also have firms like Whole Foods when the customers and employees are very liberal, but Whole Foods uh, operates in Texas uh, and is headquartered in Texas, which has a very conservative government. Um, the same examples happens to Target, Abercrombie, and many other firms. So we have firms that they're not um, necessarily, it's easy for them to decide. So we decided to look at each one of these situations separately as well. First, we'll look at the most more straightforward situation, which is if you have all the stakeholders on board, well, great, your stock market will increase. We actually see about 0.7% increase in the stock price, 0.1% increase in sales growth. I'm um, sorry, that's not actually percent, it's a 0.1 increase in sales growth. Um, and then we see the opposite situation well, when none of your stakeholders on board. We see a very large stock um, decrease, stock price decrease, and we see sales decrease as well, which was to some extent obvious to us. But then we move to the groups that you have two of the stakeholders that are, um, not aligned with firms. So two stakeholders are actually misaligned with firms. And in this case, we still see that investors will punish the firm. But interestingly, as long as you have customers on board, sales will be okay. So customers are importantly um, influential, both in terms of sales and the stock price, but their effect on sales is very straightforward as they are the ones who buy. Um, and finally, we look at when you have a safer situation, which is you have two groups on board. And in this case, generally firms do not get hurt unless consumers are upset. And when consumers are upset, we still see some negative results. So this is a part that gives us information about um, how alignment can help uh, with knowing what the consequences of activism is going to be. But we also wanted to see, is there a way, if a firm decides to do activism, to make the execution of activism better or worse for themselves? So then we wanted to look at the event itself. What we were thinking is that when investors look at an activism that happens, yes, they think of the stakeholders, but they also think how much of the 
valuable resources of the firm you're putting into this activism, how much you're committing to this strategic movement. And one of the ways that they can um, get a cue from the firm is from the form of support. Um, firms do activism in different ways. The one big distinguisher is whether they do activism in the form of an action or in a statement. An example of it is that Sephora, when they wanted to support Black Lives Matter, they closed down their entire branches in the country for two hours and then set employee education about racial equality, which is an action that they took. But um, another example would be Amazon that they issued in a statement supporting racial equality. So both these firms are doing the same types of activism, but their action or their form of support is different. One is in the form of action, one is in the form of statement. And the important part for investors here is that they believe if you do an action, you're way more committed. You are spending a lot more resources. The company is closing down for two hours, so sales get interrupted. Whereas when you do statements, that is not going to happen. And our results show us that as well, that investors punish actions a lot more than they will statements. The next one that we looked at is um, who is announcing activism? So who is the messenger? Um, Firms can have their activism announced in the form of a statement just by the firm without any specific representative. They can do it with their different representative, but one representative that can be very important is the CEO of the firm. When Jamie Dimon took a knee with his employees as the CEO of Chase, that was a lot more important and a lot more vivid to uh, investors than if it was just employees of the firm doing that. That shows the commitment of the entire organization when the executive officer, the chief executive officer, um, basically conveys the message. And that is, again, what we see that the uh, riskiness of this move for investors it seems to be higher if the CEO is the messenger of activism. Another way that firms can gauge, um, investors can gauge firms' um, commitment is based on how firms communicate the business interest. And this is really important for firms in terms of their communication methods. Uh, ben and Jerry is a company that I'm going to use for this example because Ben and Jerry does a lot of different types of activism. When they wanted to do their Black Lives Matter statements on their website, they put their statement as, this is wrong. We need to have a, an equal opportunity world for all our races. It's a social value. So they, they uh, mainly focused on the value, on the uh, societal cause, and did not bring their business into it at all. But the other example that I want to give you from Ben and Jerry's is when they had their um, activism about LGBT community or about the immigration ban. In both those cases, they did talk about the value and uh, so, social cause, but they also pointed out that it is better for our business if we can hire people with higher skill from different um, nationalities. It is better for our business if we can support um, or give benefits to our same-sex married employees. So they brought up their business. They pointed out that they can recruit better if they are, have equal opportunity for LGBT community. And that was um, one big difference that we saw in investors' reaction, which is if the firm communicate business interest, we actually see that investors reward the firm. But if they don't, and they just focus on the social cause, we see that, um, in fact, investors will not see value for their money and for their profit in the firm. And finally, the last um, group of this sorts of implementations that we looked at was alliance side. And this is when most of the times we see firms might have an act activism that they do it solely, like um, Amazon takes Confederate flag merchandise off their website. It's something that they did uh, solely. But there are times that firms uh, join in an alliance and they um, 
basically form an alliance and then urge for a movement. For example, when a uh, Supreme Court was pushing, was uh, ruling on same-sex marriage, the entire Silicon Valley uh, companies and or firms um, wrote one amicus brief to the Supreme Court and asked them or urged them to support this bill. Um, in the eye of investors, when you uh, hold hands and when you join forces, uh, two things happen. One, you bring the risk down in terms of you are not the only one to blame if people are upset. The other is that you are sharing the time and resources. So again, that is something that alleviates the risk. And we see that when coalitions happen, investors appreciate it. But when firms do the activism in a solitary form, then they're going to uh, be punished by the investors because it seems more risky to the investors. So, so far, what we talked about is um, alignment of stakeholders matters, and we talked about how execution of activism matters, um, which are both very important and can give firms some guidance into when do activism and when don't. And I used to present this research, and that would be what we stop at. We would say, okay, if you are in this situation, A, B, C, go ahead, do activism. And if you're not, don't do activism. And I kept getting an important question, which I really appreciate the comments that I get through these webinars because it helps us answer important questions. And the questions we kept getting was, but what happens if you stay silent? Is that actually less risky? And it brought us to think about an important issue, which is you are not operating in a vacuum. This is a society, you are an industry, and there are competitors in it that they might dictate the CSA strategies. They might do something that pushes you to make a move. Or you might be silent and uh, society pushes you to do a move. So we decided to move further and try to investigate these two important questions of what is the effect of competitors on your activism and what is the effect of silence on uh, firm's uh, value when society is becoming more involved in socio-political issues or is more woke. Um, I'm going to take you back to the code we had in the beginning, which was only 19% of CMOs wanted to get involved, and 81% of them actually thought that we should stay out, we should opt out, and we should stay neutral. And we want to see whether this is even possible. I'm going to give you an example before we move there, which is very recent. So recently, Georgia was trying to pass a bill, which was, was called Voter Bill, and um, this bill had a conservative-leaning um, stance because a lot of liberal um, parts of the population believe that this is a voter su suppression bill that would um, mostly push liberal votes out of the voting pool. And um, what happened was when this bill was going to uh, Congress, a lot of people were scrutinizing large firms like Delta or Coca-Cola who are headquartered in Georgia to make a move. They were thinking that, okay, you have a lot of power, you are in Georgia, you might be able to take a stance. And we started seeing banners that actually made us go and look back at that silent question, which was by your silence, you're actually complicit. So it seemed that liberal consumers do not think that when you're silent, you're actually neutral. They believe that you're actually complicit to this bill. So Coca-Cola, Delta, MLB, they are all decided that there's a push from consumers. We have to make a choice. They made a stand. And as soon as they did, then conservative consumers got upset. They turned to Pepsi. A lot of government um, officials started threatening firms um, who made a choice. And this was when I was um, interviewing with Yahoo Finance about this research. And the editor-in-chief of Yahoo Finance News put it in the best way possible. He said, OK, so we are basically seeing that firms are damned if they do get involved. Firms are damned if they don't speak out. What should we do? And that is the question that we decided to answer recently. 
So we went back to collecting data. Um, and the first thing we wanted to see was a, an important question. Is silent equal to neutral? So we wanted to see if the society, if the uh, consumers, if stakeholders believe that when you don't speak, that means you don't have a side. To do that, we, we did an experiment. We asked about 400 people on Mechanical MTurk, which is an um, outlet for running surveys on a large population of uh, society from different backgrounds, to imagine that they are consumers of a firm we called Firm A. Then we told them firm A has a close competitor, firm B, and firm B does an activism. We gave them this from the six topics of um, recent sociopolitical issues. We gave them one example, and we had examples both in terms of liberal or conservative leaning. So for example, one person saw that a firm is um, issuing a video strongly supporting Black Lives Matter. We had another one that firms had a video that was about All Lives Matter. We had the same about pro-guns against um, or pro-gun control, pro-Second Amendment. We had um, firms that urged for same-sex marriage ruling and firms for, that urged against it and so on. So each person only saw one of these examples that was, okay, firm B did such an action and firm A remained silent. We then asked people to write to us what they think about firm A's silence. Do they think that firm A is neutral? Do they think that firm A takes a stand, takes a side? Um, and then why? Why they stayed quiet? We then uh, coded all of these, ran a structured survey, and these are what we got from people. So in your opinion, does the silent firm support or oppose the competitor's activism? Um, the group of people who answered this, I want to point out that they were um, heterogeneous in terms of gender, um, political affiliation, the place they live in the United States, their age, their income, they were from the variety of backgrounds. So it's not just one particular group of people who answered these. And the answers came out as this. So in fact, only 28% of people believe that when a firm is silent, they're neutral. A lot of people do not believe that. There were some people who told us, we know they're not neutral. We don't know if they agree or disagree. And we might think that, well, that should not matter, but it actually does because they gave us reasons why firm estate silence. And those reasons really matter. Um, when we asked them, why do you think firm A stayed silent? This is what we heard. 11% um, of people said, well, they're neutral. They don't have a side, they stayed silent. We got a lot of answers that were about apathy, which was firms do their business. They wanna do their profit. Even if they do have a side, they don't want to say it out loud. And that is okay, but the interesting thing is that we got two very different framing from people who agreed or disagreed with the activism themselves. So if a liberal person saw that firm A is quiet when firm B does Black Lives Matter, their answer was firm is a profit monger, firm A who stayed silent just wants their profit, they don't care about the society, they don't care about inequality, and they put it in a very negative way. Whereas when we asked someone who did not support Black Lives Matter, they said firm A is smart. They know that their, their uh, responsibility is to their business and they want to do their business. So as we see framing of people even changes based on their own political affiliation. We also got some answers that was they, they are delaying it. They want to see what happens. They're testing the water. Uh, we got a large group of people telling us that this is risk aversion. They're afraid. They're either afraid of government, they're afraid of their investors, or they're afraid of their consumers or backlash or protest. And a very small group of people also said that, well, they don't see a need to talk. Um, for example, in terms of um, LGBT uh, examples, we told them that this is at a time that a Supreme Court, a court was ruling for same-sex marriage. And they said, if the firm agrees with uh, what the community is now or doesn't want same-sex marriage, doesn't need to talk, they can just stay quiet and content 
was the status quo. So these are what we got from consumers. And we were thinking, OK, if consumers believe that uh, firms silence is not neutral, then their reaction to the silence is based on what they themselves believe. So we are going back again to stakeholders alignment. We collected data for the events at uh, this time we collected from 2013, but to a more recent year to 2019. Um, it was about 342 events that we could match with a silent firm. And I will explain what that means. So the, the data we collected, these are some examples of it. You see here, for example, we had ExxonMobil in 2014. They voted against having uh, protection policies for LGBT community. Then we looked for the closest firm to these activists that were silent. Uh, for example, ExxonMobil got matched to Imperial Oil that at the time stayed quiet, did not talk about LGBT at all. AT&T was matched with Sprint. They're, as you see, they're not matched with Verizon, which seems to be closest financially to them. But the reason is that Verizon also spoke. So we needed to find some firm that did not make any move at the time about this particular issue. So we collected the silent firms, and then we looked at their customers' political stance again. Imperial Oil has generally conservative consumers, while Sprint and Jack in the Box moderately have liberal consumers. And finally, Honeywell International has conservative consumers. These are just four examples from our data because I want to explain exactly what we're doing here. And as you see, for example, in, in the case of ExxonMobil's conservative stance, because consumers of Imperial Oil are also conservative, they were upset why their firm is not standing for their values. And investors do respond to that by decreasing the stock price of the firm. We see the same when a liberal con consumer sees that their firm stays quiet about Black Lives Matter or stays quiet about gun control. But on the other hand, when a firm has conservative um, consumers, they are happy that their firm is quiet about a liberal issue and they increase the value of the firm. We then um, decided to again divide based on alignment and misalignment. And we look at the average response of investors. And we see that, in fact, if your consumers do not like your silence, um, you get hurt. If your consumers like your silence, you get rewarded. The important point, part is that silence is not neutral. If silence was neutral and was not conveying any information, we should have seen no effect in the market. But the, the reality is that now is not the time to stay quiet. So what can we tell managers? Uh, we tell managers to pick carefully, decide what your values are, stand up for those values, but see what your stakeholders' values are, especially your consumers. Prepare. If you really care about a social cause and you want to stand up for it, go for it, even if it's going to hurt you, but be prepared for the financial consequences. Pay attention specifically to your competitors. If you want to stay out of politics, but you have competitors who get involved, they are writing the narrative for you. So it's better for you to get involved and at least you convey your um, own values before someone interpret it and interpret it wrongly. And finally, persuade your investors. You can communicate your business um, values about any type of social issue with your investors. You can let them know how it's going to help your firm, and you can communicate your strategies with your consumers to show them your authenticity, because that is also something that really matters. If your consumers think that you are playing with this strategic move for your profit, that is also going to be very dangerous, but right now it's out of the scope of the work today, so I'm not going to focus on it. What I want to point out, though, is that it seems that there is a lot of confusion between managers and what they think their investors want and their consumers want, and then what consumers think that investor wants. So it is a transparency of information needed here. There needs to be a comprehensive information coming to all three groups, and that is a need for a third party here, which I believe is, is the job of 
people like me, academic world, to do research in a comprehensive way, not just focused on a particular firm, but on the whole society, looking at all the stakeholders and then communicate it with managers and with the investors and with the consumers. One place that we can do that really well is actually in universities, because that's where we can have our managers teach them about the, the most up-to-date information we learned through our surveys our researchers, we can talk to our investors, bring them to the table and teach them. And of course, everyone who can be in communication in a university is a consumer as well. Which brings me to the graduate programs that we offer here, which can be very helpful in terms of trans the transparency and bringing information to the table. Um, in our program, we have different types of MBAs and we have different types of specialized masters that can be very useful for doing such things. I want to thank you all and I would encourage you to give me as many comments and questions that you have. It will help me to move this research forward and give you more answers about things that we all need to know about in the society of today. If I don't get to answer your questions in this um, Q&A that we're going to have in the next um, 20 minutes, I, this is my email address right, uh, written here in warren at arizona.edu. I would be very happy to communicate with you and discuss this with you further um, after the webinar today as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Nushin, for, for sharing all this information with, with our audience. Um, this was really great, and I, and I believe everyone enjoyed it. Um, and now I would suggest we dive right into our Q&A session, as we have received quite a few questions from our audience during the presentation, <laughs> if you agree. Of course. <laughs> yeah, so um, we received a question from one of our attendees that I would like for us to open the Q&A session with. Um, so how would you define the responsibility of business to society? in general how would i define or how i think that um the history is showing us because i want to i want to actually answer that more objectively mm -hmm. yes please do to look at the history of business world we started from manufacturing we moved to consumer relationship we focused on customers then we moved to um non-market activities that we called philanthropic marketing or CSR, corporate social, uh, uh, corporate social responsibilities. And those were times that we decided that corporations have a lot of power. They have money, they have power, especially in capitalist work. Um, so let's, let's use that to help the society. Let's use that to cure diseases. Let's use that that to end hunger and the stuff that was important, but it was important to everybody the same way. But then society is moving towards issues that um, are a little bit more controversial. And I do believe that um, there are two things that pushes uh, corporations to have responsibilities towards this. And the two um, pushes, one is from the, uh, it's an organic push from the consumers. So consumers are pushing firms because consumers now when they buy something, they want to think, where does my money go? Whose pocket my money is going to? If I'm giving it to a firm that is against my social values, what if that firm uses that money for lobbying or for giving it to a particular um, nonprofit that I don't like? So consumers care. Therefore, firms need to get involved. But another one is that we also are capitalist countries, a lot of uh, developed countries are, which means that the regulations or deregulations are in a way to give companies a lot of power. When you give firms power and money, they need to be then responsible for more than just creating a product. I think that we saw that in this pandemic as well, that how much corporations could help the government by making ventilators, by using their channel distributions, by helping, encouraging people for different types of social distancing or um, any other ways to, to help with the pandemic. So I think that um, I do believe that the responsibilities of um, uh, corporations is dictated by um, the environment and as the environment changes, it will change with that. Right now, we are at a part that socio-political causes are the environment's cause. So we need to, com companies need to attend to it. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much, Nusheen. Sure. Um, this was a, a great answer. Um, and let's move to, to our next question. So um, if the institutions we're talking about are considering sales and stock price before deciding to support or not support any specific cause, how would you say if how sincere are, sincere are they actually uh, in supporting it versus making some statement that is currently only politically popular? Um, and and as, as I said at the end of this talk, authenticity really matters. But yes, there is a possibility for firms that use this as a profit making strategy, right? They can look into their investors and then decide what to get involved with. The problem with that is that um, investors pool evolves consumers pool evolves. And uh, if firms want to just keep changing their values, then the society will know that they don't actually have a root in any social cause. So it's not, at the end of the day, it's not going to work for them. So that's why we're not just saying, looking at your investor or your consumers and see what they want and do it. We also give managers some types of executions that um, they can use to diminish the, the negative results if they are going to see it when they are pushing for a sincere cause. So short answer would be if you're not authentic, it will show up in, in time. And when it does, it will really backfire. We saw that when firms had statements for Black Lives Matter and then their previous employees came out and said, hey, they were very discriminatory against different races in that company. So it will, it will show up and it will hurt the firm. So it's much better to um, try to have a comprehensive, integrated purpose-driven strategy and move towards with it and let the big strategy absorb the short-term negative effects. Because at the end of the day, it's going to change your, even it might change your consumer pool and then it will be consumers that are going to reward you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and um, here's an, one interesting question that we received from one of our attendees who has joined us from Africa today. Um, he asks if the organizations get hurt when there is international influence or activism, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement normally create um, an uproar. So as an organization, do you take heed to international activism and how can that affect the stock market in America? Very good question. Um, I want to answer that with just the exploratory research we did, because the data I have, unfortunately, I cannot speak to that. However, we did look at Brexit and the effects of that on the society. And the interesting part is that because informatively we're connected, the entire world is connected. You cannot um, be a populist in Britain and support Brexit and then in US play the role of um, universalist and exactly. work for immigrants. Um, if you do that, this um, will start a disconnect in your brand image and will hurt the brand image. So um, my answer is that whatever the firm is doing, if they're a global brand and if they are present in different parts of the world, their message needs to be consistent. It might not be on the same issue, but it has to be consistent. Yes, yes, that's a that's a really good point. Thank you so much, Nushin. Um, and here is one thought that one of our attendees shared, uh, saying that some corporate activism is done to offset ba bad behavior, either within the, the organization or in the general public, and at some point in their past. So would you say um, you're in agreement with this statement or, or not? And why not? Um, the statement is correct. And we see that. One of the examples of it was, I think, three years ago, Gillette, with their um, toxin masculinity campaign that they had, mm -hmm. that they were trying to offset their sexist advertisings of two decades ago. Now, did that work at the time? No, it didn't, because their pool of consumers were still that older generation who appreciated what it what was and they felt insulted is it going to work for them in the future my guess is yes because um let's face it you have to get younger and younger generations for a product like gillette right and mm -hmm. those people might be more um in line with that and then if they see an advertising of your previous behavior they at least know that you learn 
or you're learning, or you at least accepted that that was wrong. So it, it will work, but at the, more, at the immediate time, they might see a short-term um, upheaval as uh, Gillette certainly did. Yeah, thank you. Um, and here's another another interesting question. As I as I mentioned, we have a lot of questions that, that came in, and thank you so much, everyone. Um, so, from an ethical standpoint, should firms be involved in sensitive, um, in sensitive, um, you know, stances, or given the large scale implications that it may take with it? Um, this question to me is a little bit complicated because when we say ethical standpoint. Uh, what do we, we mean by that? The problem with activism is that um, that's, that's inherently in the definition of it. Um, I'm going to give you an example that is the, 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 most, the toughest, uh, pro-choice, pro-life. If you talk to someone that is pro-choice, the ethical move to them is to be pro-choice. If you talk to someone that's pro-life, the ethical move to them is to be pro-life. So the, the problem with activism is that ethics is um, very dependent upon people's political beliefs. It is not stealing versus not a stealing that we all know stealing is not ethical. So the problem that happens in situations like that is that if I ask that question and I see that a firm is doing something that I resonate with, to me, it looks ethical. And if someone sees it and sees that it doesn't resonate with them, to them, it doesn't seem ethical. Now, the second question, which might be uh, more important is that uh, at the end of the day, what is the consequence and is it okay? Because let's say all the firms push, pushed for same-sex marriage, therefore Supreme Court um, voted for it, therefore now we have it. I say that in those cases, usually it's the large population that pushes a movement. If a large portion of a society are moving for something, I think ethics is not doesn't matter there. What matters there is that this is a cause that everyone wants. And then this, the government and the corporations are responding to it. But again, I don't want to bring ethics to it because um, it has a different definition for each person in this webinar, actually, for each issue. <laughs> Yes, and um, in case a firm's consumers wants to take want to take a totally opposite stand to what its investors want, what stand should then the firm take in that case? What would you say? That's a difficult choice that firms have there. Um, my suggestion would be, um, I mean, an example of it is J.C. Penney. J.C. Penney um, has very conservative investors. Uh, they hired a person from Apple who was very liberal, he comes in in 2013, which was a very tough time for having pro LGBT advertising. He does those. The price of the firm gets such a big hit that they have to fire the guy because investors push for that. Now, my okay. answers to JC Penny would be several things. One, was all the firm on board or was it just the CEO? If that's the case, firm needs to first have their own values. The top management team at least has to have their values together. Um, if the firm, the, the entire executive um, uh, C-suite believe in something and they want to do it and the investors are not on board, my suggestion is using those execution manners that can help. The business communication is the biggest one that can help. Firms, um, through their um, annual report or through their um, communication and conference calls that they can have with their investors, can explain the business sides of what they want to do. And the reality is that a lot of activism that, that firms are trying to do right now can have positive business effects if you communicate it correctly to your investors. So help investors um, alleviate their risk and then move for it. Also, I think that a lot of firms um, have majority shares that they can um, plan for not to be owned by a specific group of institutions so that it helps them um, be able to dictate their own moves better. If you have a lot of, unfortunately, it's also called the activist, but it's a different definition. Activist investors is someone that can have a, a say in the behavior of the firm. If you have those, then those need to be on board with you as well. If not, you need to think about the ownership re restructure of the firm. Mm -hmm. These are really large strategic moves that firms need to do sometimes. Exactly, yes. And 
if we have a situation where a firm changes its stance on a particular cause, um, will it be a positive and profitable step in the long run or will it hurt the firm further because of like, lack of consistency towards a cause? Um, again, this brings me back to the, that Gillette um, ad. If it's something that you decided authentically that you were wrong and we want to change our stance and we want to in a long term do it, short term you're going to be a hit, but in long term it's going to bring its own reward. However, there are also firms that it's not the authenticity movement there, it's actually what makes sense for them at the time, which that, that is very, very destructive. Nike is an example of that. Nike in US had all these ads about uh, stand up for what you believe in, which was my first slide actually with Colin Kaepernick. Then when the situation, which also this, this example also answers the, the answer of our friend in Africa who was about global issues. In China, when people in the NBA um, games were standing up uh, with the um, free Hong Kong or anything about Hong Kong, China decided that they're not going to air the NBA matches anymore, which would hit Nike because Nike was the sponsor of all the shoes. So Nike then um, the, tells NBA and pushes for not having people uh, having those placards in the games, which is the exact opposite of their own socio-political stance of before, and it hurt Nike really badly. So it's there, it shows that it's not that they, they disagreed with, with their previous movement, it's just that right now it doesn't work for us, so we need to back down, and that cannot work for firms in a good way. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks, Nusheen. Um, and over the years, um, corporate social activism has changed uh, to what we have in today's 21st century. Uh, the corporate social activism practices are detailed and data driven as seen on your presentation today. So how much changes can we expect with uh, corporations in future on what can influence their corporate social activism practices? I think um History repeats itself, and I, I actually wanted to answer this, and I'm trying to uh, write a research paper on this myself, which is um, integrated purpose-driven marketing. We started with customer orientation at a time. We moved from product, and we decided that, oh, it's not just making very quality, high-quality products. We need to actually be customer-oriented. Uh, firms have started doing customer surveys. They started to have customer service, which was kind of like a one act, separate actions. Then we realized that, oh, this needs an integrative strategic movement. CRM apps came in. We mechanicized it. We um, automized it so that firms know in each and every aspect when they're looking at customers, how should they do that? I do believe that the same is going to happen with non-market actions like activism or philanthropic marketing, which is firms are learning that we actually need a group to be in charge of a strategic, comprehensive, consistent movements in this way, that I can't just do one move here and then my next move has nothing to do with the previous one. So my um, hope for the future and my guess is that firms will start having, um, first of all, a person in a C-suite, chief diversity of chief purpose officer, some sort of a chief that then has a team and that team is in charge of having integrated strategic movements in this um, aspect. <laughs> yes, thank you, Nushin. And we have just enough time for one more question that I think would be great to close the Q&A session with Ed and add on to your um, previous answer. So one of our attendees would like to know which function within companies is for the most part responsible to make a decision on whether to take a stance on a, a social political issue or not. So basically, who would you say is in charge of determining corporate cult thank culture? Thank you for so that to say. <laughs> Thank you for that question. My answer is that right now we don't have that person specifically in firms. Mm -hmm. Some firms haven't started that. Ben and Jerry has a group now that are in charge of these, um, but most firms don't. And therefore, sometimes it's what the CEO says. Sometimes it's what the chief marketing officer says, which brings me again to the point that I believe that firms do need a purpose-driven group in charge of these moves that can be in communication with customers, in communication with investors, all the stakeholders, so that they know what they should do and how they should do it. We need it. That's my answer. 
<laughs> exactly, and I think we all agree with you, Nushin. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this was great. Thank you so much for sharing oh, this God. with our audience. Um, and with this question, we're going to close our Q&A session with. Um, thank you again for this wonderful and such an insightful presentation, Nushin, and for all the information you've shared with us uh, on the corporate social political activism. And if you have any final thoughts for our audience, please feel free to share them. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I'm so honored to, to look at the list and see um, we have people from all over the, the world and, and all sorts of experiences, which is really valuable to me. So please, this is my email address. Do not forget it. Please write to me if you have any comments or any thoughts that can push us to do more of this work. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much again, Nushin. It was a great, great pleasure having you with us today. Um, and thank we would you. also like to thank our audience for joining us for a webinar and for your amazing engagement in the session. We all saw um, some amazing questions today here. Um, and we hope you all stay healthy and well. Uh, we hope to see you on our future webinars as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you.